Okay, I'm going to be honest. Last week in my Alan Wake video, where I praised and gushed about Alan Wake's story, characters, and gameplay, at that point, I had never played Alan Wake's American Nightmare. So when I said this week I'd be going over American Nightmare, Quantum Break, and what has been going on with Alan Wake 2, this was all coming from a perspective that Alan Wake's American Nightmare is basically a throwaway game. A spin-off that doesn't really add anything to the discussion or continuation of the Alan Wake series. I could not have been more wrong. That's why today, instead of a video where I brush the game aside to talk about Alan Wake 2's struggles, don't worry, we will still be doing a video on what happened to Alan Wake 2, but hopefully with now having two videos on the Alan Wake games, it'll be much more concise and to the point. I felt like this game deserved a dedicated video because I believe Alan Wake's American Nightmare does have a stigma that because it's an in-universe spin-off, it isn't a must-play game like the original. So today, let's get rid of that stigma and take an in-depth look at Alan Wake's American Nightmare. I do recommend if you haven't seen it, I have a video on Alan Wake, A Forgotten Masterpiece, to get yourself reacquainted with the story, characters and gameplay of Alan Wake, as just because American Nightmare is a spin-off, doesn't mean the story and the characters of the original aren't referenced here. He is chasing a dangerous quarry, the Herald of the Darkness. Alan Wake's American Nightmare released in February 2012, less than two years after the original game. The year before, in 2011, American Nightmare was being leaked and rumoured to be Alan Wake 2. A rumour, Remedy quickly shut down, stressing that this entry in the Alan Wake universe would not be Alan Wake 2, neither would it just be more add-on content. This happened in May of 2011, but we would have to wait until December of that year to finally get clarity on just what Remedy was working on. Alan Wake's American Nightmare finally dropped an announcement trailer for the game in December, displaying a tonal shift with this entry, seeming to be more spectacular in its gameplay, along with it releasing on the Xbox Live Arcade. In the game's dev diaries, this tonal shift is explained by Sam Lake. Alan Wake is Stephen King and Lost, whereas American Nightmare is a lot more Quentin Tarantino and From Dusk Till Dawn. A perfect analogy, and after playing through the story and setting for myself, it probably is one of the reasons I ended up enjoying the game so much being someone who loves Tarantino's storytelling and worlds. American Nightmare released just a couple of months after the announcement trailer for Xbox Live Arcade, releasing in May of the same year for PC. Selling over half a million copies as of July 2018, says VG Charts, and was met with very positive critical reception, with many loving the value for money prospect, the improvements in gameplay, but with many finding the story to be a letdown, and some classifying the game as just for fans. Lucky for me, I'm a fan of Alan Wake, so I've already ticked that box. So let's jump into the story of Alan Wake's American Nightmare. Before I get into the story, I will be going over the entire story. The game has been out for seven years at this point, but nevertheless, I feel the need to say, spoiler warning, if you still want to go into American Nightmare spoiler free, skip ahead or come back after you've beaten the game. Okay, as I've stated before, Alan Wake's American Nightmare is an in-universe spin-off. So far, I will get into this later. Which is set as an episode of Night Springs, the fictional TV show presented throughout the original Alan Wake. We begin the story with Barry asleep in a motel room with the TV playing an episode of Night Springs. The Night Springs narrator, who truly makes this TV show feel like an episode of The Twilight Zone, 
So major props to voice actor Lloyd Floyd. He absolutely nailed the role along with having a name that rhymes, which is pretty, it's pretty baller. The narrator explains to us that Alan is attempting to chase down the Herald of Darkness and evil counterpart created by the darkness, Mr. Scratch. Scratch is on a mission to take away everything Alan loves and essentially take Alan's place in the world, feeling he is the superior of the two. However, Alan is the champion of light and has the ability to rewrite reality as he is able to write his escape from Cauldron Lake, where he awakens in a small town of Night Springs, Arizona. He learns he has been missing, even assumed dead by his wife Alice, for nearly two years. It's this detail here that makes the story very interesting to me. We learn through finding the radios and even some later characters what Barry and Alice have done with themselves and what impact the loss of Alan has had on their lives. Even when being asked about Alan, both Barry and Alice become almost angry that no matter what they do or how they move on in their careers and lives, the interviews find their way back to being about Alan Wake. It's here that the character growth and relationships I described in the Alan Wake video is really expanded upon, especially in regards to Alice. Thanks for tuning in for the second part of our interview with Serena Valdivia and award-winning photographer Alice Wake. Now Alice, we were talking about your husband, Alan Wake. Is that a sore subject for you? Well, a little bit. Of course it is. The way I see it, we had our good times and our bad times, and on the whole, we had a lot of good times. He really made me happy. I don't mind being reminded of him. I really wish this was more of an integral part of the story instead of being on the radio, as because I'm being meticulous and ensuring I can go as in-depth as possible, I listen to all of these, but some may miss these really great moments, and it is a shame. While we are talking missable moments, the TVs around the world really show what lengths Mr. Scratch will go to to damage Alan's name and just what is at stake if Scratch gets loose in the real world instead of Alan. He is truly someone who is insane, seeing multiple times his love for luring people in with his charm and just when they are comfortable and he gets what he wants, they're done. Again, moments like these really show the stakes we are dealing with, but can be missed if you just think these are collectibles and not necessary. Okay, back to the story. After leaving behind a sinking Cauldron Lake cabin, we come across an oil station that is engulfed in darkness. Spawning too many foes to fight, Alan starts seeking the safety of light, so heads to a nearby hotel where we meet a girl named Emma, who at first believes us to be Mr. Scratch due to, well, them both being Alan. A theme we will see throughout the story. Emma tells Alan that Scratch was at the motel the night before and providing us with a manuscript page that serves as a way to alter reality and stop the darkness at the oil station, giving us a checklist of items to obtain so we can alter reality, send a meteor on a collision course for a satellite, which then dive bombs itself into the oil station, blowing it up in just spectacular fashion. After returning to the motel and fighting off the Taken surrounding Emma, once the Taken have been dealt with, we go and talk to Emma again, finding out Mr. Scratch had made his way to a diner up the road, and upon finding the keys to the motel rooms, we find Emma has been killed by the darkness after not heeding Alan's warning of staying in the light, and through exploring the motel rooms, find a man dead with keys to the observatory nearby. Upon arriving, again, we meet someone who mistakes us for Mr. Scratch in Dr. Rachel Meadows, who refuses to let Alan in initially until the Taken try and kill him. 
proving to her that he is not Scratch. Rachel tells Alan that Mr. Scratch had been using the observatory to track a mysterious signal that was sent just before we destroyed the satellite. After learning Scratch was hell-bent on obtaining the signal, he concludes that this signal must contain the key to fighting the darkness. Needing to fix the telescope that the darkness had sabotaged, proving to Alan that this signal is important. Upon repairing the observatory damage, only a portion of the signal comes through. We see that this signal is a page of a story, a new reality that Alan can hopefully successfully create. The page leads us to a nearby drive-in theatre. We meet a girl named Serena, who is clearly under the darkness's influence. However, in this instance, Alan being confused for Scratch works in his favour, coaxing information out of Serena on how to get the power on. After getting the power back on and returning to Serena to turn the building's lights on, Serena, clear of the darkness, tells us that Mr. Scratch intends to stop the sun from ever rising again and gives Alan the security code for the projection room, where he can alter reality. After following the limited clues the partial message conveys, the new reality doesn't take effect. Scratch mocks Alan for attempting to change reality without the full signal and takes us back to the start of the game. It's here the story can turn a lot of people off, because it's at this moment I stopped my first recording session. Realising you're playing through the same three levels, not just twice, but three times. I think the game does well in regards to having the characters Alan meets begin to start helping Alan by setting up certain events more and more, meaning we aren't playing the same levels for too long. But still, it's here the wind really got sucked out of my sails in regards to the story, even if I believe the gameplay and side stories really improve from this point. We go through the motel again, Emma dies again even after taking Alan's advice this time. We reach the observatory and still the signal is incomplete. And once again, go to the drive-in, get to the projection room, and fail again. We start from the start a third time. This time finding the oil station is ready to go from the start, thanks to the help of Emma, this time being able to save her. At the observatory, we finally get the full signal, make our way to the drive-in, and finally alter reality. Mr. Scratch discovering, Alan has been successful in his new reality and is burned out of existence. On the screen we have Alan and Alice reunite along a sunlit shoreline, however the narrator notes that this could possibly be just a figment of Alan's imagination since he is still trapped in the dark place. During the credits we find out the name of this episode of Night Springs that Alan wrote is titled Return, a reference to the end of Alan Wake. And in the post credit scene, we see Barry wakes up suddenly, believing he had heard Alan's voice. And that is the story of Alan Wake's American Nightmare. The truly interesting point of this spin-off is exactly that, leaving the question of, was this just a spin-off story? Will this come into play with Alan Wake 2? Whilst I think the story repeating the same three levels is really a bummer, I think it is handled well enough that they don't feel the same each time. Also the game only took me around 4 hours to get through, so it doesn't feel like too much of a hassle. The story on the whole is really an interesting one. Hearing about the world without Alan, how far Mr. Scratch and the darkness is willing to go to get what it wants. The setting in Arizona, the motel, the observatory and the drive-in are great locations to explore and learn more about this reality. And here, we just see how much Alan has grown as a character. However, the true magic of this game is in the gameplay this time. American Nightmare, at its basics, is the same combat system as the original game. 
Alan has his trusty flashlight, the flare gun, flares and flash grenades all make their return, but now the weapon variety is much greater. Now we have the nail gun, the SMG, assault rifles, more shotguns, even a crossbow. That will take out the enemies without needing to burn away the light. It's with these inclusions that yes, the game doesn't play as tense throughout the story, but it is a blast to play. My personal favourite inclusions being the SMG and the crossbow. It just feels so good to get in the Taken's face after the original game and absolutely shred them with the SMG. And having the crossbow take out even the biggest of foes, mostly with one well-placed shot. The game feels great to play, which is helped with the enemy variety again, being upped in comparison with the original Alan Wake. Having multiple big enemies, varying standard taken, enemies that duplicate when the light hits them, but the more they duplicate, the weaker they are. And now having the birds turn into Taken and act as tough ambush enemies. Whilst the gameplay is far more fast paced, with this enemy variety it still can go up shit creek very quickly if you aren't paying attention. The removal of Taken taking light damage unless your flashlight is facing them always ups the ante as instead of slowly weakening the enemy and toggling between zooming to ward them off. In American Nightmare, with this feature removed, it forces you to use your light sources in better ways, and not just when you're stuck in a corner. The gameplay improvements, whilst limiting the tension experience before, this tension is still here on Nightmare as enemies here are no joke. But the gameplay is really well demonstrated in the arcade mode. Face the enemy, make your stand, fight till dawn. I'm not gonna lie, my initial impressions back in the day was that American Nightmare was just this arcade mode. I didn't think we had a story mode and we just had a time based score chasing mode. This mode is a ton of fun. A statement I never thought I would say, but with the gameplay improvements I stated before with weapon and enemy variety, the simple task of staying alive until dawn and get as many points as you can is truly an addictive prospect as, well, I'm a competitive person and I want to do the best I possibly can. You start the map with no weapon and need to find weapons, light sources, ammo, supplies and health stations, aka light poles, to both kill enemies, avoid getting hit and increase your score multiplier to get a good score by dawn. Weapon crates are around the maps requiring you to have gotten a certain amount of manuscript pages in the story mode, which I thought was an awesome touch and personally I found the pages a breeze to find. The minimap literally shows you where they are. The maps are separate areas from the story and really it is just a good little mode to play. As I said in the gameplay section, this is intense and also incredibly satisfying to play. And that is no different in arcade mode. In fact, it's heightened. Alan Wake's American Nightmare might not be the perfect experience, but it was one hell of a surprise once I finally booted it up after seven years. The story is something very intriguing, especially if we do see some themes and aspects carried over into Alan Wake 2. The improvements to gameplay, the live action moments in game are shot beautifully. The soundtrack that unfortunately I'm too afraid to show in this video due to YouTube while seemingly not knowing what fair use is. But trust me, there are some epic moments that are epic due to the game's soundtrack. If like myself, you liked Alan Wake but never got around to American Nightmare, I'd strongly recommend you finally give it a go. It is something special, and because we do not have an Alan Wake 2 yet, we still don't know if this game is truly a spin-off. Next time we visit the Alan Wake series, I'll finally go over the age-old question of what happened to Alan Wake 2. And that video will be out before the release of Control. 
but I will be doing videos and a few new games releasing such as Wolfenstein Youngblood and maybe a Darkest Dungeon clone in between, so stay tuned for that. But for now, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to leave the video a like, comment below your thoughts, and if you haven't already and you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with the channel. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at MareHairBear for gaming pickups, gaming opinions, and apparently lately, over on my Twitter, movie reviews. But if you made it to this point, thank you, and I'll see you all in the next video.